Thanks, Curtis. Uh, well, yeah, so it is a pleasure to be with you this morning, church, uh, especially to you, the Journey Metro East. You are missed and loved. Uh, so if you want, you can open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. We'll be starting in uh, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Well, if you've been uh, with us, we are continuing our series uh, in the book of Colossians called The Chase. Uh, and, and really what's happened here is Paul is writing to a church uh, that is addressing some kind of heresy uh, in their midst. We don't know the details of it, but we know that this heresy really is diminishing Christ's presence and power within the church. So Paul paints a high view of Jesus, glorious, exalted, uh, triumphant, who is immeasurable, eternal, and sovereign over all things. And yet he says, this very same Jesus is chasing after you. He wants a relationship with you. And so we're now in the part of the letter which basically says, if, if this is true about Jesus, all these things we have said about him, all these things we have said about you, we who are then wise should respond accordingly. You should stop running from him, stop chasing after the, the things you once chased after, and said, turn and chase after him. You are to live a life that honors and pleases him. And really, this should be the desire of every sincere Christian. It is the natural response uh, of when you love somebody, that you honor them. It's the way, uh, the Bible tells us, that your soul will actually be satisfied. And it is going to be the way that the world will see Jesus' beauty. And I would say to you this morning, if you're not a Christian, but you're listening anyway... I want to acknowledge maybe you're not concerned with a life that pleases God, but you probably do want a life that pleases yourself. And you're here only really because uh, you've tried everything else and it's left you wanting and unsatisfied. To you, I'd say you're welcome. Uh, that's how most of us got here. But, but I do want you to know that a life that is uh, good and pleasing to your soul is not that far different from a life that is good and pleasing to God. And so uh, let's pray this morning. Uh, well, actually, what I want to do, I'm going to tell you, here's where we're going to go. Here's how we're going to live this life. Uh, there is going to be an old life that you, you need to put away. There is a new life that you're going to need to put on. And there is another life to put above. All right, so let's, let's pray and we will dive uh, into this text. Father, uh, you have said that uh, every single word of yours uh, falls from the heaven to the earth, and it does not return to you empty, but accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. And so, Lord, I do pray that your word is purposed this morning to edify your saints, to encourage them to fall more deeply in love with you. Lord, as, as those in the Gospels would say, sir, we just want to see Jesus. Father, I pray for those who do not know you, that may be listening this, uh, this moment. I pray, uh, God, for them. Uh, that you and your kindness would reveal yourself to them. So, Father, we thank you for the gathering of the saints, however you may see fit in this season. I pray this in your name. Amen. So, point one, there is an old life to put away. As I, I said, the, the tone here really shifts in chapter 3. Paul knows in light of uh, this truth he shared in chapters 1 through 2, there is something to do. And this is an important point because I think that a lot of times in Christianity, we can stop at the truth and exalt that, but we forget about the response that we're supposed to do, right? Or we can respond, but somehow we divorce it from the truth. And yet the Bible says they're always interconnected. Truth demands a response. 
and a response should be driven out of truth. And so what is true here? Well, what's true here, uh, starting in this first section, is that Paul says it's time to put to death what's earthly in you. It's time to put the old self away. Now, if you're like me, on a first reading, that raises a lot more questions than it answers. Questions like, obviously, what does it mean to put to death what is earthly? Why does Paul single out these sins and not others? And why are Christians so, why do they refuse to be more progressive on sex? Another question, is God really wrathful? So let's answer a few of those. First, earthly. What does it mean to put to death what is earthly? Uh, well, you could summarize it as this. It's the things that are opposed to Jesus. Pastor Curtis last week summarized it as this. Sin that enslaves, systems that replace, and suckers that seduce. And I think he just wanted to get me to say suckers. Uh, here's how I thought about it. An idol or something earthly, is anything that, does it reduce Jesus? Does it cause me to think less of Jesus? Does it replace Jesus? Meaning, does, uh, is something that I should be finding in Jesus, I'm finding in this idol, in this thing that is earthly? Or third, does it uh, renounce Jesus? Right? If, if I do not get this thing that I'm after, will I be tempted to renounce Jesus? So Paul says, uh, we must put these things to death. Uh, I'll give you an illustration. There is, for me, nothing like a good quarantine to help me realize just how much I have neglected my yard for the last several years. One spot in particular is a flower bed I have as I, I walk up to my front porch, and it's the bane of my existence. I've had a very easy life. Uh, see, this bed is covered in a landscape rock. No dirt is visible, but it doesn't matter. Uh, weeds always come up by the hundreds every spring. And every year, my wife and I will weed this bed, spend hours doing it, pulling up roots, recovering the bed with more rocks, spraying it with weed killer. None of it matters. A week or two later, the weeds always come back. One year, uh, my dad came over to help me, and he said, I've got something to tell you. It's always going to come back. I said, don't you put that evil on me. Uh, he said, whoever laid this rock did you a disservice. Because they, they should have laid down a, a landscape barrier, right? That, that keeps the moisture out. It keeps the sunlight out. And, and so the things, uh, like the weeds, cannot grow back. But instead of being reactionary every year, you could just cut this off at the source. You don't feed it any longer. He said, but to, to put these weeds to death, it's going to take work. You know, you, you, Charlie, have spent years covering up these weeds with, with rocks, and you're going to have to pull back layer by layer to actually get to them at the root to put them to death. And here, Paul, I think, is saying something similar about your sin. See, he knows Jesus is not interested in helping you to cover up your sin, only to have it show up later, every time you feed it. He, he wants you to put it to death. He says you have to cut it off at the source. And if you think Paul is using hyperbole here, I would encourage you to read Jesus. See, Jesus in the Gospels, he is regularly after your hearts and your thoughts and tensions. Right? He says that's where murder and adultery are birthed. Jesus says uh, if, if your right hand causes you to sin or your eye causes you to sin, you should cut it off or tear it out. Now, he's not being literal. We know that from verse 23. Uh, but this is the attitude that we treat sin with. See, Jesus is not for a life that is just a whitewashed tomb, beautiful on the outside but full of bones on the inside. He says it's not what goes into a person that defiles them, but what comes out of their hearts. And if we miss uh, what working on what's below the surface and become satisfied with what's masking in our hearts without the Lord actually doing the work on it, we're not really putting these things to death. We're just covering them up. We keep piling rock and rock upon it, but the weeds keep coming up because they've never been put to death. So how do we put it to death? Well, we're going to have to pull back the layers to get to the source and take an honest look at what's underneath. And some of this is so deep, you might need a counselor at Karis House to help you do this. You might need a, a pastor that you trust to help you. I'll give you another example. Um, I've gained eight pounds since the stay-at-home orders got put in place. 
Uh, I got to cheer for that here. <laughs> it's not because my gym is closed, though. I didn't, I didn't go to my gym anyway. I do have a membership. So how did I gain more weight, you ask? Well, I ate more, obviously. But why? What's, under, what's underneath that? Well, food became a distraction for me. What's under that? What was I distracting myself from? Uh, well, you know, new, re- new seasons. I wasn't sure I was doing my job right. I'm not sure what the financial future will look like. I- I'm worried about the vulnerable in our church. I- I'm grieving the loss of being gathered with our church. But why would those things cause me to eat more? Well, underneath that is it's all uncomfortable. And food for, the- for a while was the one thing bringing me comfort. Now, there's nothing wrong with comfort or food, obviously, but do you see how quickly it can become an idol or just as destructive? Do you see how in my heart it replaced Jesus, right? That it, it, Instead of finding my comfort in Jesus, I was finding it in food. Do you see how in my mind it reduced Jesus, uh, right? That Jesus was not enough to satisfy uh, the longings of my soul. Do you see how if I don't get it, whatever that idol might be, I might be tempted to renounce Jesus. And see, this is the problem with idols. This is the problem with the weeds in our life. They look like they're going to be a source of life and comfort, but they only bring death. They take life from us. Weeds take the nutrients that belong to the plants and snuff them out. Idols rob us of true comfort, true joy, and true knowledge. Jesus said in John 10.10, the enemy has come... uh, There's only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. You see, the idols want to rob you of true life where it cannot be found. So to to put the death at what is earthly in us, we must dig deep in our heart. We must cut them off at the source. There is no life or energy or time to give to an idol that will only be used to kill or destroy you. Why these sins? Well, uh, I would say, one, it's because the Colossians struggled with these sins. Some probably in their past, some probably currently were struggling uh, with the idea of the the sins of sexual immorality and the sins of the tongue. And so if that's you this morning, I want you to take heart that you are not alone in your struggle. You never have been. And if you are Christ, there is no condemnation for you even now. I want to remind you how Paul started this letter to the Colossians. He called them saints and beloved brothers in Christ. This is true of you this morning. You are saints, faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. You are not lesser in the eyes of Jesus because of your struggle. If you have trusted his atoning work on your behalf, you are fully known and fully loved in this moment. But we should know that Scripture paints these two categories of sins as particularly destructive, right? Sexual and sensual sins and the sins of the tongue. See, Scripture says sexual sins are unlike others because of all other sins are outside the body, but a sexual sin, a person commits their own body. As a quick aside, I hear so often uh, in, in friend circles, see, this is the problem with Christianity, If they would just be a little more progressive, if they would just ease up on the sexuality stuff, if they just stop it, they would get more followers. And I would argue that perhaps you are reading the Bible and history wrong. Jesus is the progressive in this relationship. See, Jesus, uh, and I I would say, forget for a moment how the church has screwed up, because the church has. But do not confuse the Christ with Christians. See, Jesus progressively denounced a society in which women were mere sexual objects. And that played out in polygamy, forced prostitution, a system in which murdered women for committing adultery, but somehow blamed the women when their husbands did it. Jesus progressively said in the age of Aphrodite and Venus, sex is not to be worshipped, rather exists to help you worship. Jesus said, it will not fill your soul, dear woman at the well, just as it did not fill Solomon's soul and his hundreds of wives and concubines. Jesus progressively said, I condemn those who make children stumble. And he did it in a society that treated young undeveloped boys as playthings for their pleasure. And I could go on and on, but Jesus had no interest in keeping things status quo. He was progressive. And most of the issues facing the church today are not new. They're old and pagan. 
And embracing idols in the name of progress will not only not work, it's not even true. It's totally regressive. And if you're going to hold up the broken, sin-sick world of ours and then compare it to the dignity and worth that Jesus gave to people that were nothing more than sexual objects, or, or the way that Jesus satisfies the soul of those who desperately were trying to fill it with longings, with perversion and promiscuity, give me the way of Jesus every time. He says, sins of the tongue, these, these two are destructive See, uh, James tells us in 126, if a Christian cannot bridle their tongue, their religion is worthless. He goes on later to say that the, the, the tongue is a fire. It is a world of unrighteousness, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell itself. Do you see the power of the tongue to destroy uh, Galatians compares it to this saying, you, you are nipping, you are biting at one another, you are devouring one another. It is a, akin to spiritual cannibalism. See, one sin destroys your body and one destroys the body. And I think this is why he names them specifically. It's true he groups them together, but he names them individually. And I think what, what uh, Paul is trying to do is he's trying to say, look headlong into your sin. Know it for what it is, and you see the evilness that exists in it. Because when you name it, and you, and you consciously choose what should be repugnant to you, do you see what you are doing? But also when you name it, it helps you narrow the focus. It helps you know the enemy. Is it a daffodil or a dandelion? Well, what about God's wrath? The argument I hear today also is that I believe in a God of mercy, or God's wrath, that's Old Testament. We're New Testament. This, that's, that's pagan. But I want you to know the journey, the pastors here are going to preach Christ crucified. And what that means is that th there is a hope in the cross. That God's wrath was poured upon his son instead of deserving sinners like me. This is the necessity of the cross. For without, without it, God would be unjust and there would be no punishment for sin. He is not a petty, spiteful, wrathful God because he dislikes your behavior. No, it is the necessary reaction to true holiness, to justice, to wickedness, to exploitation, and every kind of evil. It is the natural outpouring and conclusion of his love. If God loves you, and he does, he must hate what would harm you, kill you, and destroy you. If the cross is true, then, Christians, we can no longer engage these things that killed our Savior and would kill us. We are called to a new life. That was point number two. There is a new life to put on. And so, in, in these you once walked, Paul says, right, in, in verse uh, six, seven. In these you two once walked when you were living in them. And these two we once walked. And we tasted the bitter dissatisfaction that sin brings. We know what it means to make shipwreck of our lives. And these two we once walked. We hurt ourselves, our families, our friends. And these we too once walked. And we chose death over life. And these we too once walked. And then we met Jesus. And he replaced our mourning with joy. And these we once walked and we met Jesus and he satisfied us with his righteousness and these we once walked, and then we met Jesus, and he turned our night into day. He opened his right hand and gave us his pleasures forevermore. He brought peace to our souls, and then we met Jesus. And these two you once walked, and so from now on, we pass judgment on no one. And these we too once walked, and we, we plead with others to come and take a drink from the water of life, to hide yourself under the mercy of Jesus, to come and be made new. And these we too once walked. And since we no longer walk in these ways, we have put on new ways. And this is not a metaphor just suggesting that you're in, you need a change of clothes or you're a, you need a new set of standards. No, it's suggesting you are a new person. You are a new person. So how do you know if you've been made new? Well, a, a quick test. The old self might look like this. Hardened to sin and conviction unresponsive to the word of God, bearing no fruit of the spirit, no desire for the things of God or the people of God. But the new self looks like this. 
You're broken over sin. And things that never once bothered you now bring conviction. You find your heart strangely warmed and moved by God's word and prayer. Changes start to happen in your life that you did not bring about. You find in your soul love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But these things did not come from you trying harder or a self-help book or an image consultant, right? These, these are a response to the grace that you received in Jesus' love for you. There is desires now in you motivated and controlled by the Spirit of God. You're made new. And of course, the goal is not simply to become more moral or kinder or more self-controlled, to, uh, to create an image for yourself that people would like and the world admires. No, that is not the point. You are not creating an image for yourself. You are being created into an image of your true self. I'll say that again. You are not creating an image for yourself. You are being created into an image of your true self. When you become a, a, a follower of Jesus, you are a new creation. The old man passes away and the new comes. And what you step into is the life that God has always intended for you and his children. That you would be an image bearer uh, reflecting him to the world. And as you grow, that reflection of him should become clearer and clearer. And this is why you must put away your sin. One, for your own sake, but also for the world's. If the world is going to see Jesus through its, his church in a world that is confused and divided, we do not want to make the picture any cl- foggier than it needs to be. We put things away. And I know that this can be hard, uh, especially in this season. It reminds me of the uh, story of the church, uh, the church father, Augustine. Now, you might, you probably, many of you know Augustine, many of you don't, but Augustine was an African church father. Uh, you can probably trace much of your good theology back to him. Uh, the publishers of Christian History magazine said this, after Jesus and then Paul, Augustine of Hippo is the most influential figure in the history of Christianity. It's a big standard. But that's not how Augustine started his life. Uh, Augustine, if you were to study his life, these, these uh, verses listed here in uh, uh, chapter, or sorry, verse 5, that was Augustine's life. He was a big fan of him. And uh, the story goes that he actually lived with concubines and prostitutes for years, right before he was converted. Then, one day, he was saved miraculously by the Lord. The story goes, he was walking down the street, and this prostitute that he lived with for years saw him. She shouted his name, but he kept walking. He saw her, but kept his eyes straight forward and walked. She continued crying after him and ran after him and finally said, she said, Augustine, or Augustine, it is I. To which he replied, I know, but it is no longer I. And this is a season, I think, where many of you might hear your old life calling after you, saying, it is I. I I see how you are pinched and stressed. You are in the midst of change and discomfort all around. And it's easy to slip back into old habits. But know this, if you have trusted Christ and are his, you might fall back into an old sin. But you cannot go back to the old man or old woman. Because they are dead. And in their place is a new person. God has made you new. He will not let you be happy or satisfied in your sin. So my encouragement for you is, okay, go. Ask for forgiveness. Do it once. Nothing is added to your forgiveness by the amount of times you do it or the sincerity of it. Simply come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. And he is pleased to forgive you. Find the source of that sin. Put it to death and try again. Each morning there are new mercies for you, including right now. These failures do not negate the progress you've made or the shaping that Jesus has done in your life. But if you are going to continue to grow, you must become like him. And to become like him, you must know him. My my fear is that the church thinks that they are growing in the image of Jesus, but when in actuality, they are trying to grow Jesus into the image of themselves. They do not know the biblical Jesus. They interpret Jesus through the world around them. Perhaps that's you. How do you, become who, uh, how do you become like Jesus? How do you be challenged and shaped by him? I have a few questions you could ask yourself. Does Jesus always agree with you? 
Or perhaps when you dis- disagree with Jesus, do you change? Does the word of God ever challenge you? Do you ever pray to him and ask him to grow and change you even when it's scary? Do you ever make adjustments in your spiritual life when you feel dry or distant from him? Do you know his word better this year than you did last year? Can your long-term friends point to areas in your life that you've grown in over the years? Are you teachable? Do you learn from others in the body of Christ, or are you always doing the teaching and the talking? See, in Jesus, we are finally able to be again what God has always intended us to be. And it does not matter the background, the culture, the race, economic status. God is calling all of his people to the same thing. Be renewed in the knowledge of your creator. So how do we do that? Christ must be elevated to his proper place along with the, uh, the others in your life. So point three is this. There is another life to put above, namely Jesus for the sake of others. So Paul concludes in verse 11. He says, here. What, what is here? Here he means the household of God, not just simply in Colossae, but here. There will not be division. So there was an elaborate network of prejudice, suspicion, and arrogance amongst individuals and groups ingrained in this culture. The Greeks thought that they were privileged because uh, through Alexander the Great, they had conquered much of the world, and, and they thought Jews were weird for circumcision. Jews thought the Greeks were shallow and morally dark and weird for polytheism. Barbarians were uneducated country folk. The Scythians were like the ultra-barbaric, uneducated country folk. Kind of like when you Missouri people use the word Hoosier, you want to be like, calm down, you're all from the Midwest. Slave and free, you can imagine the damage that is doing in the church. And Paul's point here is these prejudices from these pre-Christian days cannot distort the new life in which God has created in the new man. A diversity that is me-centered devolves into a list of anger and malice and slander and lying to another, right? It becomes spiritual cannibalism when you begin to look out only for your own interests. Now, Paul is not saying that culture doesn't matter, that your culture is unimportant. It's actually the opposite. See, when I met Curtis four years ago, he quickly became uh, one of my best friends, Uh, We have very little in common. When we hang out, he's going to eat snoot, worth a Google, if you don't know what it is. He says words like sucka. And for me, I'm going to eat mayonnaise. It's like the Swiss Army knife of condiments. Uh, Tiger King is my culture. For real, I knew a dude who had illegal zoo animals. I didn't rat him out, though, because I ain't no sucka. I think I used that right. See, Paul's point, Paul's point was not to strip away culture so that the church was one homogeneous organization, but rather to Jesus we submit all things to him because he's above all people and above all things. And in that, we actually get more of one another. See, in Christ, we lay down our preferences and desires, our demands of our way of doing things, and we submit them to our brothers and sisters for the glory of Jesus. We bear with one another in our sins and ignorance for the glory of Jesus. We celebrate differences and diversity for the glory of Jesus. We forgive one another for the glory of Jesus. We correct and rebuke one another for the glory of Jesus. We identify growth in diversity for the glory of Jesus, and we repent and make adjustments where it lacks for the glory of Jesus. And we do all these things because Christ is all and in all. When we say our mission is to be a diverse community centered on Jesus Christ, this verse is what we mean right here. Now, this is aspirational. We probably always have room for growth. But do you see that the gospel is what makes this necessary? The gospel is what says you are to love others and count them more significant to yourself. And and, and, in a diverse body, if they are precious to the Lamb of God, they should be precious to you. If they are celebrated by Jesus, if he has helped shape their culture, then that should be the culture that you want to embrace too. The gospel is what makes this necessary. The gospel is what empowers us to do it. We, like Jesus, then can lay down our rights for the good of others. We can submit to one another. We can put one another's interests above our own. 
Why? So that the world would know. God's people live differently, they speak differently, they love differently, because Jesus is a different God than the gods that they serve. He is not an idol that must be put to death. He is the God who died and raised and lives forever. He is both the author of life and death. So what do we do with this? Well, I'm going to ask you just a handful of questions. Question one, what is this? What, what do you need help putting to death? Maybe you need to get help. Maybe it, it has been a besetting sin of yours for years and years, and you have seen the destruction that it brings. Where I would start here is Romans 8.1, and, and that you should know that there is no condemnation for you. And since there is no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus, that means that you can be open and vulnerable and transparent to others. Maybe you need help putting this sin to death. Where have you seen growth in your life? How are you more like Jesus today than you were last year? Because I, I think that so often we can mope in our sin, but we forget to remember the grace that we have received in Jesus, that he is committed to you, that he will bring to completion the work he started in you until the day that you see him face to face. Where is that growth? Celebrate it. How will you grow in the knowledge of the Savior? How will, how will God challenge you to know Jesus so that you are not putting Jesus into your image, but you are growing into the image of Jesus? How are you pursuing diversity? This is not limited to race, but it should include it. Who in the body of Christ do you have a friendship that is not like you? Who in the body of Christ do you love that you disagree with on things? Who in the body of Christ uh, has something to teach you about their culture or their upbringing, their economic status that you would benefit to know, both in the love of Jesus and the service of others? How will you grow in diversity? Brothers and sisters, we need to finish this race well. One of the ways we will do it is by pursuing the knowledge of the Savior together. Let's pray. Father, it is a great kindness that you have given us in the midst of just a world that is shut down. We can still gather uh, remotely. Uh, it's you, Lord, we're pleased not only to give us your word, but your son. And we know that those who belong to you uh, this morning are seen and loved and treasured. And God, I pray that they start there in a motivation to put to death what is earthly in them that they would believe that they are new in you, Lord Jesus. You have, you have made them new. Their old way uh, of life is dead and their new life has come. I pray that you help us grow in that. I pray that you help our church as we pursue diversity, as we seek to be a diverse community centered on Jesus Christ. Would you help us, Lord? Help us know our blind spots. Help us know where to celebrate would you bring more to this church? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.